Greetings, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Coming to you with a special show today with a special guest, a very special guest. Sitting to my right is Harry Crocker, the Vice President, Executive Editor of Regnery Publishing. He's a military historian. He is a novelist. And besides that, he's just a, an all-around good dude. I'm, I'm pleased to have you here, Harry. Thanks, thanks for talking to me today. My pleasure. So both of us, by the way, I, I think you know this, the people out there, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades, you all don't know this, but like me, I'm a bit of a rare breed, a displaced Californian who came to Mississippi. Californians tend to turn up their nose at Mississippians. And yet Harry is also a Californian turned Mississippian. How's that going for you? You live about 90 minutes from me, Harry. Yeah, no, we are, we're loving it. This has been weirdly a long-term dream of ours, but, um, but yeah, we're finally here. I've been here about a month now. Yeah, you're getting, getting unpacked and whatnot. It's weirdly a long-term dream of ours too. You've seen our place, walked about the grounds a little bit. I just didn't know when I lived in California that there was such a thing as, as multiple trees that stood <laughs> next to each other, right? People don't know that. There's a thing where trees are next to each other. Yeah, there, there's that. And the, I, we, last <laughs> night, my wife and I were walking around. We, nutria? Have you, have you encountered Nutria yet? No, nutria are like muskrats. They're like muskrats that are infesting Louisiana and coastal Mississippi. <laughs> And there are these big, giant rodents, but you can eat them, apparently. So my, I have boys who are hunters, so maybe we can uh, bring over some. Oh, chalk that in the pros column. <laughs> yeah, at first, it sounded muskrat, sounds a little bit like a con. Yeah. But, uh, and and the, all the Californians out there are going like, yep, this is what we thought. <laughs> but, but then you, you turn the corner, and you can, you can eat the muskrat. So uh, in, in your grill, California, yeah. we can eat our rats here. <laughs> um, well, so. Harry, aside from being uh, a man who wears many hats and vice president and, and exec- cowboy boots and, and cowboy boots, yeah. I saw, <laughs> and and as well as a America tie and a you look sharp in a blazer, uh, you are a guy who knows a lot about the Civil War and has an interest in the Civil War and takes, like me, an interest in such folks. You've written books on Robert E. Lee. You write, wrote the politically incorrect guide to the Civil War, and most conservatives around the country in the 21st century are very blue-pilled and brainwashed about the propositions the Civil War stood for. And I just I thought it would be good for us to have a conversation about the Civil War because it seems that it's becoming practically relevant. Once again, so do, yeah, first off, yeah, I just yeah, want to say, yeah, you know, practically relevant. And, I, and when I wrote the Robert E. Lee book, that was, gosh, more than 20 years ago now, it was, it was a really different conversation when I used to go out and talk about that book because um, the sort of people who are, are now out there in force taking down statues were, <laughs> were a rarity. I mean, that was like an extreme position. And it's certainly growing up when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. I mean, you watch any Western, there's the, you know, the displaced, heroic, admirable Confederate guy, <laughs> including, in a, you know, yeah. I just watched not that long ago, a rerun of an old Rod Serling TV show called The Loner, which is a Western. And the, I think it's the very first episode is, features an old Confederate veteran being defended by the loner, as a former Union guy, um, from some punk who <laughs> is you know, tying down the flag. And this is a, Rod Sterling was someone who cared a lot about civil rights, right? But it was it was not outside the realm of liberal conversation. In fact, it was it, it was common in liberal conversation. In histori- famous American historians um, like Samuel Elliott Morrison would take a relatively pro Southern view. Even in the '90s, you had a, a very famous PBS <laughs> TV series called The Civil War, and it was you know moderately. Um, pro-union, but the star of that show was Shelby Foote, right. who was a big uh, pro-Confederate guy. And, I remember. Yeah, and people gave that a hearing. Everyone, uh, they, this, is, this was the acknowledged, unifying, uh, ac- accepted view of the Civil War, which was that it was an American Iliad. You had heroes on both sides. It, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt said this. Right, I remember. Um, yeah. Famous speech. And, and, and even if you could be a pro-union guy, but you could admire a man like Robert E. Lee. I mean, Robert E. Lee, if famously, his portrait was in the White House of Dwight Eisenhower, right? Right. Um, so this is, this is not, but nowadays, it seems like this is 
it, it's hard. I've noticed so much for younger people. It's hard for them to get beyond the idea of racist, racist, racist. It's, just, it's all done. You just say racist. And I used, to, I used to posit this idea, which had a lot of currency when I would say it. I think if I said it now, it would be much less popular, which is that suppose, we were, suppose the union divided now over some issue like abortion. How many of us, say, say, say Virginia left the union because of the issue of abortion. How many people in Washington or in Maryland or New York would have thought it would be a good idea to send tanks across the 14th Street Bridge? <laughs> you know, air bomb, you know, to blockade uh, Virginia's ports, to you know, carpet bomb the Virginia cities and whatnot. I think very few. I mean, nowadays people think of secession as sort of, yeah, if Scotland wants to be free from the United Kingdom, okay, fine, more power to them. If Ukraine, these Eastern European countries want to break away, fine. But, and people would, when I would say that, they would say, yeah, I never really thought about that way before. Right. But nowadays, I think the punitive nature of liberalism is so much that that would not be the case. No. They would think of it more or less like they've been framing these people, the unvaccinated. <laughs> they must be punished. And if, if governors get in the way, we will blow them aside, um, which is you know, a completely different understanding. When, when, the, when the war began, this is another famous story, but I, I think it's a telling one that, again, used to resonate with people. Robert E. Lee was offered command of the Union forces. This is a man who'd been in the Army his entire adult life, had served in the United States his entire adult life, who opposed secession, who never had slaves of his own. He had inherited slaves, by the, but, he, but he gave them their freedom before, um, actually before the Emancipation Proclamation uh, took effect. But the... Um, but he said, look, I cannot consent to turn my sword against my home, my family, my native state, save in support of Virginia, I will turn my sword against none. And I would think you know, anyone with, who views these, these uh, divisions in human terms could understand that, right? right. <laughs> it's, not, it's not ideological. It is a human, communitarian, fundamental, natural thing. But people have become so ideologized that that's, I think, harder for them to understand now in a way that previous generations of Americans totally understood. And Lee also said that famous line I love of his, which I think is also relevant here, is a union that can only be held together by swords and bayonets has no charm for me. Yeah, I love that line. So, I mean, that, that's yeah. part of it, too. Are we going to be held together by mutual sympathy and mutual uh, uh, ways of thinking about the world, mutual values, or is it by force? And increasingly, what I find frightening is the liberal answer is force. Yeah. And not only is the liberal answer force, but in your destruction, which has been you know, more or less just winked at by the Republicans, your destruction of these statues, which of course, as anyone with a mind could have known, it's going to go way beyond Civil War general. It's going to go way beyond Confederates. It's going to hit the founders. It's going to hit Lincoln. It's going to hit everybody. The missionaries. Yeah, in the missionaries in California. I, uh, well, the, the 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 most taken down statue was Christopher Columbus across the country. Um, but these people who are at war with our history, they they really are at war with America. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, a couple of years ago, I wrote a a article for the American Spectator. It's called "Why Our Next Civil War Will Be Worse Than Our Last." And it was going, but even then, things were not as bad as they are now. But it was going along these lines, which is, as Lincoln said, you know, this, we, are, we are a divided people, but, I'm paraphrasing badly here, but, but we, we, have, we, 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 we venerate the same Constitution. We venerate the same founders. We worship the same God. There was much more commonality. And in that, right. um, in that piece, I cited something, because I was writing these Custer novels, <laughs> uh, that George Armstrong Custer was a union officer. He, at West Point, he loved his southern comrades, but he couldn't go with them. He was a Michigander. Um, but during, during the war, actually during the war, he attended the wedding of a Confederate officer <laughs> <laughs> and flirted with the southern bells at this Virginia plantation. And because there was... To be fair, you know, yeah, but, <laughs> that, that's what you do, I guess. Right. He, <laughs> in well, the 18th he was a great defender of the patriarchy. So, uh, yeah, he was. But, but, uh, but anyway, so that, but yeah, you had this sort of commonality. I cannot imagine, you know, a, uh, 
a member of Antifa attending a wedding of a proud boy, remember? Like that. It's, just, it's not the same thing. Well, you do do up the blue spikes. You know, you get your get your hair did, and and you go to uh, another Antifa wedding prep. I I think. Tell me what you think of this characterization. Seventeen eighties, uh, during the great debates, uh, as they've been called, the great constitutional ratification debates. You have the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and they were close together, you know, razor-thin margin distinguishing them. I mean, famously, Madison kind of went back and forth to the Anti-Federalists with all his Virginia friends. Then for a period, he was more friends with the Federalists, who tended to be more northern. And then he came back to the small government side. But that wasn't crossing any great chasm, right? That, that wasn't that surprising because they were— if you if you map this out on like a 20 foot whiteboard, then even though at the time zoomed in the difference between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, small government and, and big government folks, I think I said that backward, big government and small government folks in America in the founding, in the framing, they were really felt far, but they were like a millimeter apart from each other if you map this out with today's political spectrum. That grows a bit, this is my view, Harry, that grows a bit by 1860, 1861. Now there's there's more of a chasm. There's there's uh, a, a wider margin of, of differentium between the view of government, what is government to do, taken by Lincoln in the North, many of whom were, were uh, many in his cabinet were actually enthusiastic Marxists who took a big view of government, and, and the South. But they're still close enough for the reasons you could – you, you, you adduced earlier that, that, that uh, you know, a Southern Bell could still be flirted with by a, a Yank, right? Or, or Southern Bells, I should say. But nowadays, we've just gone the opposite direction. One, what accounts for this? And two, what is to be done about it since we're talking about America civil civil wars? I think it has something to do with the receded, faded notion of what a republic, that is to say a res publica, is – you already adverted to this when you made mention of the fact that even Lincoln acknowledged there's still something we hold in common, a res, that's a thing, publica, a commonly held thing. St. Augustine writes about it. St. Thomas writes about it. Republics always need to be peopled by citizens, denizens of the polis who hold one thing in common. Do we hold that thing in common at all anymore? I guess that's like three questions. Okay, so... so um yeah, yeah, well, let me start this way. More about the former underlying unity, which still exists in some parts of America today. So you yeah. can be a conservative today, and you could, depending on your temperament, like Jefferson, you could like Hamilton. And in some ways, you could like both, because the divisions, that which seemed stark at the time, seem less so now. Right. Um, and so, too, in 1861, who's on the Great Seal of the Confederacy? George Washington. Who's the most quoted uh, founder in the South? Thomas Jefferson. I mean, and it's not as though the North had abandoned these people as um, early American heroes. Now, this will sound a bit strange, perhaps, but I think it's true. I remember telling people about this at the time, that this, I, well, maybe, the only way I think we ever get back to some sort of unity is another channel in American history, which are these sort of great, Christian revival movements, new, a new great awakening, because I think that's the fundamental problem now. Yeah. And it starts with, um, you know, many people thought that the whole gay rights thing, well, so what? I mean, over and done with, not a big issue. By the way, sorry, uh, on that note, sorry, I keep touching your leg. On no, 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 no. Totally <laughs> incidental, we both left that aspect of California <laughs> behind, so sorry. Yeah. But, I, but I would tell folks, you know, look, this may seem like an unimportant thing to you, yeah. but if you're going to say a man can have a husband, it's only, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to a man can be a woman, right? Or a woman can be a man. And, and once you get to this level of irrationality, and this is what it is, all these people say, science, 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 are the most irrational people in the world. Yeah. And, but, and once you come to this level of rationality, if, if you cannot agree on what marriage is, if you cannot agree what a man and a woman is, you're not going to have rational debates about marginal tax rates, <laughs> right? So yeah. this is the problem. This is why the republic is coming apart because on the most basic level, I mean, on the most on the level that was never before in history questioned. Right. And I think this is another thing is that we think about, there have been wars and genocides and 
police states, and all these horrible things in history. You and I both know that, right? But I would have heard that, that, that never in the history of mankind have things been this crazy. Yeah. When you had people like Nero and the, all these, these you know, the, the, those were even at the time seen as, holy cow, I mean, this Nero guy, he's kind of lost it, hasn't he's he? He's a weirdo. <laughs> right. Caligula, kind of fiddles. lost it. Yeah, Caligula. But nowadays you're thinking, oh, well, that's his choice, and if he, you know, why, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. He likes his sister, big yeah. deal. That's yeah. what they'd say. And now. moreover, I mean, I, I, people obviously don't know where this is going. I mean, you, yeah. when you break ground on these sort of new, gigantically new, horrific expansions of irrationality, well, we remember things that were not so considered so irrational before and were accepted actually in the ancient world or in parts of the world today, were like polygamy or pederasty. I mean, those things will come back. And, and I, I, I keep up a lot with the uh, British press because we've lived in England for a while. And you know, more secular society than ours, in a way, in a way it isn't, but there you also have these secular conservatives saying, you know, if we lose even the sort of cultural Christianity we've gotten, we, we have, we've inherited, uh, what happens to like the sanctity of life? What happens to, I mean, all these sort of basic right. questions, which yes, that's a problem. A lot of these things that people, even the left, take for granted as, well, that's just a given. Uh, no, 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 it's not a given anymore. If you take away this Christian foundation, no, it's not a given. Um, so anyway, I think that my maybe glib, but you know, answer, but, all, but not glib in the sense that it has happened in history before, not to have to recover so much lost ground as now. Now the ground is so much lost, it's, it really is. We're facing, a tsunami has swept over us. But great awakenings, revivalism movements have had profound effects in American history before, and I don't see any other thing that does it. It's not going to mean, elect Republicans, great. That, but look at the Republicans you're electing. They're not fighting a lot of these battles. They don't even understand them. They refuse to. They refuse to understand them. They refuse to. Like uh, we were talking about the statues coming down. I mean, how, again, how many Republicans stood up against that? Well, Darn how many few. Republicans said, hey, man, Robert E. Lee was a great noble gentleman of the South. I don't care what sort of um, political capital might have been mustered by these blue and pink haired freaks in the streets. I'm going to push back against that political capital and say, Robert E. Lee is one of the greatest, most based Americans in the history of the Republic. And, and he contrasts rather starkly with, with uh, Grant, you know, the degenerate drunkard gambler from the North. It, it doesn't matter where he hails from, right? Lee, everyone acknowledged, was this great moral gentleman out of the great Virginian tradition. And I'm going to push back on that, and I'm going to have some fun with it as I do so. That's not what, what Republican politicians do I, I'd like to, um, you know, put a pin in one of your points. It goes like this because it's a great point, and I know it's a great point because it, it echoes something I say in uh, the case for patriarchy, which you can get now. It's not just on pre-order, folks. You can go to <laughs> Sophia Institute Pressing and order the case for patriarchy, and it will come later this week or next week. Um, this is, I think, why we can no longer avoid this frank conversation about civil war. You know, about civil wars. There's a quickening. That There's an ideological concomitance or even an ideological morphology between feminism, which is what my forthcoming book is all about, Case for Patriarchy, which it took about 100 years to base, okay? And feminism is the proto-proto-transgender, and you, you just pointed this out, Harry. And it, this is all, we're not talking about feminism now, we're just talking about feminism qua bellwether for the need or the undeniability of civil war. Feminism is the idea that a man can act like a woman, a woman can act like a man. Next comes homosexualism, chronologically, the idea that a man can act like a woman and vice versa in the bedroom. Right? And then after that, of course, came transgenderism. It's, a, it's just a step up on the ontological spectrum. A man can be a woman and vice versa, right? Like, dig this. What? Feminism took about 100 years to base. It took from, I count, 1848's The Real Inception, the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York with Elizabeth, Katie Stanton, and a bunch of other uh, uh, angry dames who got together to, to air out some of the complaints. They reify a document called the Declaration of Sentiments, which is a hilarious title, but that's, uh, that goes with the territory. 
So it takes from about, you know, 19, 1848 to about 1950 to get feminism going. But then look at what happened with the homosexualism movement in Hollywood. It really started the mid-90s, around the time of second, what's called second wave feminism. It, it takes till, I count, 2006 to really be in full swing. That's 10 years, right, until you get Prop 8 in California, which is the, the coming out party. No pun intended. So you go from 100 years for feminism to based and to, to, to sow its toxic seeds or whatever metaphor you pick. Then it goes to 10 years for its kind of transmutated form, homosexualism, to gain sway. That's a logarithmic growth function, particularly then when you consider the third iteration, which is transgenderism or transsexualism or whatever. They completely did away with the term transvestitism right because all the transvestites before it was a man in a dress now it's just a, a woman uh, that took place from about 2015 to about 2016 so it's a logarithmic growth curve you go from 100 years for feminism to base 10 you know 10 to the second for feminism 10 to the first years for homosexualism to take root and then 10 to the zero power zeroth power for transsexualism to go like what's next and is it going to just take a tenth of a year we can no longer get along with each other there is no res publica anymore because there's a great quickening as father malachi martin called it and no and i don't have any interest i don't think you do either in in hearing out the next wacky iteration of this from the left and they certainly don't have any interest in hearing out from us why robert e lee was really a good dude like so what's left for us um, there's a great line that the opposite of love is not hate, it's power. Um, it, it, that comes from Andrew Nelson Lytle, who's a Southern agrarian. But I think that's part of what's driving this, the speed with which this train is going, yeah. is that all of these um, philosophical errors or disorders or whatever you want to call them, um, they are being given political power and yes. political motives. And I often think about it. if you were a a Democratic Party statesman, stateswoman, statesman, <laughs> politician. <laughs> I mean, you should have some interest, you would think, in the topic of what perpetuates the civilization, right? And who in their right mind would say, "Oh, I think what perpetuates a civilization is um, bringing in lots of diverse peoples and breaking down marriages." and endorsing perversity <laughs> yeah. and taxing people a lot and regulating everything because that's really the lesson of history, isn't it? This is what makes for a great society. I mean, <laughs> when, when it, I always used to say, when people say diversity is our strength, and you and I grew up in California, a pretty diverse society even back then. Right. But you know, there were people there who say, the great strength of the diversity of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? Or the, the, great, <laughs> the great diversity of the Balkans has right. been a great unifying factor. Right. Or, or the, you know, the Rwanda, those Hutu and Tutsi get along so well. No, I mean, in historical things, these are problems, right? Yeah. And breaking down the family is a problem. And overtaxing the people is a problem. And overregulation and the growth of bureaucracy are signs of corruption. And yet every single one of these things, the majority party in this country perpetuates the exact opposite of what any literate person who has read history would be thinking. And so why do they do it? I mean, are they completely deranged? Well, I think in large part they are. <laughs> They're in large part ideological. But also, as we've seen throughout all these COVID restrictions, they assume they are insulated. If you are Gavin Newsom, if you are the, <laughs> if you are the governor of California, and, and everywhere in San Francisco, the streets are full of drug addicts and people you know, defecating and fornicating in the streets. Do you care? No, you live behind your gate <laughs> and your kids go to this, you know, ritzy school and you go to go to these wonderful restaurants and it's just, they think they can work their way around it. They won't, it's kind of like a more <laughs> uh, Mediterranean version of democracy where <laughs> they have lots of rules, but yeah. everyone knew is you have to, you know, just ignore them, right? Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to a more English, Anglo, for traditionally Anglo-American based uh, rule of law, which is you have darn few rules, but they're important. It's your civic duty to obey the law and you know, do what you're supposed to do as a good citizen, which I will say is something else that was just tied into all this about these Confederates. Because I think it's, really, I, I, and this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I don't think too much because I had a reason recently 
to go through the biographies of every darn Confederate general that ever was. And one thing that my, my big takeaway from this was, now granted, these were generals. A ton of them went to West Point. It was astonishing, though, how many also, or instead of, had become lawyers. Hmm. And how many of them had served in state legislatures. These were people who were very invested in, their, in the Anglo-American legal and political tradition. And when we talk about the fighters, yes, they're the fighters, they're extremists in, in the South, but there were a lot of really well-grounded people in the law. Yes. Um, and that when we talk about slavery and all that, yeah, yeah, tr yes, don't have to downplay that too much. But there are a lot of other issues going on here. And, and saying that used to be something that everyone knew. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, to the basic thing, going back to the founding, the, the Constitution was ratified by not the people at large, by the states. Yep. And so the, the understanding of the South was what we entered into willingly, we can exit willingly if it's not in our interest, which is also why someone like Lord Acton, after the war, I had a famous correspondent, Robert E. Lee, and he said, I, I, I'm going to badly bolish this, 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 uh, this phrase too, but he said something like, I mourn for what was lost at Appomattox more than I rejoice in what was gained uh, at Runnymede with the Magna Carta. Right. Because um, his, his point was wow. that, that secession was a great check upon the federal power. Wow, I didn't know he said that. Yeah, because if, if, the, if the states can invoke this threat of secession, it's more like the federal government needs, needs to behave itself. Right. You cannot sure. press federal power to such a degree that it alienates the states. So it's a, gr it's a great natural, uh, it's, it's, check, it's another check and balance. You, if you remove that threat, what stops the federal government Amen. from becoming the gargantuan creature it is now and having a president like Joe Biden saying, I'm going to knock all these governors out of the way. Of course. Can we, so can we, there, there's a, man, there's so much in what you just said, but I, this is really where my heart lies. I'd like to talk about secession with you a little bit and, and, and partly just note, I, I could do the coy thing in interviewers trick where I go, why, why do conservatives r repudiate the notion of, uh, secession so much why have we banished it from our thought you know perish the notion or why why do we just refuse to talk about it but i already know what it is it's that w that's what we do as conservatives we lose that's what they do as the left they win they if there's you know four square inches of the political landscape or the cultural landscape that they don't own their generals the left whoever they are these shadowy soros like figures are screaming at them go get those four square inches that's what explains this, you know, the storming of all the Western civs institutions. But so, so simply, we've just we forfeited that ground. But I, I do feel that there's some really important, there are some threads here that, that have to be picked back up. And here's what I mean. ISI, uh, Inter Intercollegiate Studies Institute, had this really dynamite panel last week i think it was just friday literally just three or four days ago and you know it was a, a good it was a panoply of i think the right people people that you and i know and like know personally and like a lot of regnery authors so we're going to say good things about all of them um i think all of them but but one are regnery you, you had a panel uh, panel of stephanie slade who's a kind of fusionist libertarian you had uh michael anton uh, of, of sort of Claremont Straussian pedigree, who's also, I think, a, a Regnery author. And he was kind of the, the biggest advocate of big central government there, but very, very smart guy, taught me a lot about uh, color revolution right before, right before it was on TV. The revolution will not be televised, right? Uh, you know, at three in the morning is when they did that, uh, right, right before the election this last year. Michael Knowles of Daily Wire fame, who's, who's a, a personal friend of mine and a good, good dude, uh, you know, representing sort of the Catholic, Catholic slash, uh, I don't know, moderate post-liberal position. And then, of course, uh, Kevin R.C. Goodsman, who's, who's, you know, very, very close to my view of, you know, and I think yours, uh, another regnery author who's, who's a big representative of the state's rights position. And with, uh, at one point, Michael Anton and Goodsman, again, I like both of these guys, uh, I like their writings a lot, and I like Anton personally very much. 
never met Goodsman. They were talking about whether or not this idea of secession was legitimate. That is really what they were talking about. That's the subtext. And what they were saying was, you know, a- Anton, like a lot of the, the Straussian guys, they say, look, the union was formed. The union that Lincoln would advert to time and time again was formed at 1776. And I, I just, I have to demur. And I thought Gutzman would because I know his, his published perspective and he, he does demur. He didn't really push back too much at ISI this past weekend. And that's just not right. At one point, Anton even acknowledged that rather starkly, they're like, hey, there was a system when, when the 13 colonies declared their independence from Great Britain, right? That left them 13 separate countries. Uh, people now don't understand. States means countries. It's a capital S. And they had a kind of wartime treaty gov you know, that only had one branch. It was a Congress, which is a treaty government, you know, sovereign international immunity principles, basically League of Friends, League of Nations, almost like the EU, except good, um, that, 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 uh, that united them, the Articles of Confederation, until they ditched it, borderline illegally, in 1788 and, and supplanted it with the Constitution. So Anton admitted this at one point, that really they weren't the 13 colonies become states, were not a union until 1788, but the abiding uh, conservatives in the American Academy, the only places of conservative strongholds in the American Academy are very Straussian places, and they hammer down on this notion that that you know union is something that can be entered into and left from. There's ingress and egress. And accordingly, they, ha- they, they, they always say, well, the Union was born of 1776, which was Lincoln's spurious rhetoric. It was really 1788. The 13 sovereign states were left sovereign states until they entered into a constitution. And the understanding was always, hey, look, if this gets too wild, if you get too many blue-haired freaks pulling down uh, statues of heroes, saying that men can be women when they put on a dress— you know, wanting to kill babies, making this the centerpiece of really one or both of the major political parties, then we can we can Audi 500. We can get out of here. And I don't understand why this isn't a more embraced position by conservatives. I get why the Straussians kind of big government right wingers like it, but I, I, I can't I don't imagine what the reason for all the other conservatives could be, because no one was shouting this at the ISI event. Like, what do you think? Yeah, well, on the one hand, <laughs> secession is an alternative to war, right? I mean, right. That, that's a, that I think is one of its virtues. Of course. Um, and I will say, I mean, Anton, I know, believe, or has raised the prospect of not secession of states, but secession of counties. So just as West Virginia was carved out of Virginia during the war, right. So, too, I mean, those remaining red parts of California could maybe get, you know, Republic of Jefferson could get next to Idaho or something. Right. Um, he sees that as a possibility. Both Anton and you and I, I think, would agree that one of the big problems here is our people would like to be left alone. <laughs> the problem is they won't leave us alone. This is part of the whole thing. They want to put us in the re-education camps. And uh, that's what makes this thing unnerving. I, I think conservatives are also obviously very slow moving. So conservatives are still looking back on those days when, hey, remember World War II? Where were we unified back then? Or, 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 or maybe after 9-11, where, wasn't we all unified back then? And so they, they, are, they have this nostalgic yearning for, well, again, it, it, it's, what, um, it's what Lee said. I mean, I, I wish for no other flag. I mean, he, again, he opposed the session. He didn't want anything. He wanted America. Right. But the problem becomes when they won't let you have America. And actually, this is in a way what um, another issue for, uh, for Lee or for the Upper South was that people also forget that secession was a, this is generalizing a bit, but it's basically a two-step process historically. First, you had the states of the Lower South pull out soon after Lincoln's election and inauguration. But the second part were the states of the Upper South, states like Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, why do they pull out? They pull out for a different reason, actually. 
They pull out after Lincoln demands that they raise troops to put down the Southern Rebellion. Right. And this is the step too far for them. So then we, I think this also has unfortunate reverberations with today. So look, we don't want to secede necessarily, but if you tell us that we're going to go down and have to put down Tim Gordon, Harry Crocker in Mississippi, guess what? We're not up for that. No, that's not, that's not happening. People won't stand for us. <laughs> <laughs> the legions we stand won't stand for us. So, but, but that's part of the, the issue is force. Yeah. And actually, uh, not to get too biographical here, but throughout Lee's entire life, and this is from a military officer, but one of the things he always thought was wrong, I mean, this has become more apparent when he's a, he becomes the president of a university after a college. Now it was Washington Lee University, but Washington College. But um, was, you know, here's a Lee, a very Christian man, but he thought you always lead by example. He didn't want mandatory chapel for his students because he wanted people to choose the right thing. That might be like free will. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this idea of not forcing people, it's also why he, th he wrote a famous letter to his wife before the Civil War saying, I think there are few people who will now argue that slavery is anything other than an evil. I mean, he was, before the war, he's talking about slavery as an evil thing. But it's how you get rid of it. And this is actually the, the, a long-standing historical, Ameri I mean, from Jefferson, we've got the wolf by the ears, you know, right. imagery and all that sort of stuff. It's how do you get rid of this thing we've inherited? Right. And Lee thought, as I think not too long ago, most rational people would have thought, you do it through persuasion. You, and, and rational, gentle persuasion. He referred to the melting influence of Christianity, which is why he and many of his fellows hated the abolitionists so much because they thought they were just loons who were driving people away with a sort of hysterical rhetoric, like William Lloyd um, Garrison saying the Constitution was a pact with the devil, and you know, and because they, they mentioned because of slavery, or people like um, John Brown, of course, you know, being sort of a terrorist and whatnot. So. But they thought, and this is actually a weird thing, that, that Lincoln, Lee, and Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, all agreed on was that slavery would go away of its own accord over time. Right. And it, what, the only thing that, that, that changed that whole agreement was the war. I mean, where it becomes changed. And act, actually, uh, Lee also had a letter after, I think maybe to Acton, but he certainly, to someone, he wrote that, you know, never, when we think about what was lost in the war, None of us regret the loss of slavery. We only wish it had been done in a different way. <laughs> we only wish it had destroyed America, particularly with the evils of, you know, the Fourteenth Amendment. Now, uh, no one—the perfect way to instantiate the principle, the, the, the proposition stood for by the principle you just articulated, Harry, is that nobody is out there. Not me. Not anyone. None of my neighbors in Mississippi. None of your new neighbors is out there lamenting the passage of the 13th Amendment, right, which formally freed the slaves. No one's out there lamenting the, the first couple lines of the 14th Amendment, right? This is, this is good. Um, procedurally, it was incorrect, but except it was the doing away of a grave moral evil, slavery. None of us like it. It's all wrong. People out there who are listening don't hear us wrong. Giving, you know, freeing the slaves and making them citizens was was a good thing but but the 14th amendment is the real fruit of the poisonous tree the fruit of the procedurally incorrect lincolnian tree and maybe it's a punishment that we had slavery in the first place and that we had it for almost 100 years i kind of look at it like a scourge the 14th amendment constitutional scholars which is you know where i hail from they call this the second constitution the 14th amendment is almost as long as, uh, you know, Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution. It's not a couple lines or a paragraph. I did a show on this a week and a half ago, the evils of the 14th Amendment. And here's what I wanted to challenge. It's the same, same ISI conference with many of our, our friends and smarties on the right. I wanted to challenge all of them, aside from Gutzman, who I think knows this only too well. Why the pervading bias that Lincoln had and seems to have popularized that, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help are anything but the worst eight words in the English language or whatever Reagan quipped, right? Now I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help is something that even conservatives seem to take 
seriously. And, and the proof is the 14th Amendment itself. It made it illegal for states to render illegal porn, contraception, abortion, sodomy, gay marriage. It made it illegal for the states to have an official establishment of Christianity, a state sect, which the First Amendment originally required till that was reversed by the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment alone proves to a lot of these post-liberals who are big government conservatives, if there's such a thing, if that's not a circular square— they will, and a lot of the people at Claremont, I studied at Claremont Graduate for, for a while, which is like the most opposite place you could study while you're studying law at the U University of San Diego School of Law with the originalist center, center there. They just don't realize that we have had vice foisted on us, the good states like Mississippi or Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, whatever. We've had it foisted on us federally by the 14th Amendment under the same action that was foisted on the southern states in the Civil War when they, the southern states, had the right procedure but the wrong substance. At that point, they were kind of going to bat for slavery even though none of them liked it. Nowadays, in what some people are predicting to be the coming American Civil War, at least the Cold Civil War, as it's been called, I think by Angela Cotavilla, who's another Straussian kind of Claremont guy, that now the southern states like our new home, our new shared home of Mississippi, Harry, it has the right substance, namely abortion. Look at what Texas is doing in some of the, and, and our state, Mississippi. And it has the right procedure. States' rights, federalism, in, a, in the Catholic Church we call it subsidiarity. That's the right procedure. And now it's not opposed to the primary policy agenda, which is getting rid of abortion. Before in the Civil War, you could say, well, you know, maybe the wrong side lost. But hey, the North was trying to do away with a grave moral evil. Now that substantive position is opposed, uh, is no longer opposed to the procedural position, where we have the right issue and we have the right way to get it, states' rights. That you couldn't always say that in the Civil War. So that's one thing we've got going for us if this thing turns. Yeah. Um, so so the, there's this story called or the story. There's this theory, theory of history called the Lost Cause, right? The Lost Cause is something that the South propagated immediately after the war, which was that the war was not about slavery primarily. Um, and uh, the. I think that's important in itself because if something was so fundamental to you, would you deny it, right? And they, one of the great um, Civil War generals you don't hear enough about is a guy named Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor was the son of Zachary Taylor, former Union general, or former general, former uh, president as well. And he said, he, hey, there's this famous speech by Alexander Stevens who was the vice president of the Confederacy called slavery the, cor the cornerstone of the Confederacy. And he said, he, he railed against Alexander Stevens. That was a, that was a controversial speech at the time. But after the, after the war, he wrote, uh, Taylor wrote this great book called Destruction and Reconstruction, which he says, all we fought for was having a say in our own government, the same say that our, our, we, our, we had inherited from our ancestors at Runnymede and Magna Carta, right. and, uh, and yet our own vice president said it was for nothing but slavery. So all, after the war, you have all these statues go up, right? And you have all the, you have the, the as we're talking about Rod Serling's show before, and what becomes the accepted version, the sort of gone with the wind version, which is actually good history, I will say as a historian, <laughs> which put the South in this bigger picture, which was the way the South wanted to see itself, and I think it was l largely true. One thing I think is important is why, it's, it, I, I never, in the, when I was younger, I never liked to question people's motives, but I actually got this argument from Peter Hitchens, who was talking about, in, in the context of debates between atheists and Christians. So you and I can debate about that all day long, and we can never necessarily, arguably, prove anything. But then you can ask, well, I know why I want Christianity can, to be true. I may think it's true, but I also know why I want it to be true. Right. Why do atheists, he said, want their version to be true? Because as a former atheist, he thought he knew, and they were all bad answers. And I think there's something similar here. All right, so I can understand you know, people having different opinions about the Civil War. Why do you want to believe that the South was a proto-Nazi state? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to believe that Jefferson Davis, who 
was limited to one term <laughs> under the Code of Constitution was a proto-Hitler, right? right? Why do you want to believe that this was a, pro, a proto-Nazi state when there was no genocide? There was no, there were no slave rebellions. There were no slave, slaves were extremely valuable to these people. I mean, Richard Taylor talks about how a Southern plantation owner would gladly sacrifice his son to go join the Confederate Army, but did not want his slaves guarding um, contraband cotton bales <laughs> because they could get killed. Don't, don't, don't go down that road. Right. <laughs> I need you here. Um, a, a state, a, 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 a country, the Confederate States of America, or a, a confederacy, that was so riven by states' rights, it was a problem <laughs> for the conduct of the war. Yeah. I mean, these people, they, they were free traders, right? right. They, they were, it was a very libertarian government in many ways that they represented. Why do you want to misrepresent that as proto-Nazism? Why do you want to take this version we had agreed on of these American heroes like Rodney Lee, Stonewall Jackson, both of whom opposed slavery, um, I mean, Jackson only accepted it because it was in the Bible. That was that's the whole reason for accepting it. Um, and yet, you now want to say, well, you know, Lee was at best Brommel, and I don't know what they think Jackson was. They probably don't know enough about history. To know <laughs> but 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 why do you want to believe? And the only reason you can want to believe, I think, that America was Nazi had this Nazi blood in its veins in the past, is because you want to blow up America. Yes. Either that or you're, just, you're incredibly short-sighted. And just want to say, well, all those Southern people, they're all Democrats. We, this is actually Republican says all the time now. I don't care about all those Democratic statues coming down. Right. They weren't Republicans. Oh, well, they've taken down Lincoln too. Well, I guess that was a mistake. But right. you know, these other guys, they can all go. Right. But no, yeah, the problem is if you, if you hold slavery as this you know, ineradicable, worse than anything else, th then how do you? I mean, the founders go down too. It's inevitable. You need to, and it's, it's not as though, again, not that we're pro-slavery or any of these things, but you need to see these things in an adult, mature, historical way as inherited institutions, right. which these people did not feel comfortable with. The best they could do was to make this idea of, the positive good argument was that we have brought these people out of deepest, darkest Africa. We are, over time, they're going to become good Christian citizens, over time. That was, that, that was sort of the enlightened Southern view. Uh, that was the positive good argument. Um, but Can I, it, yeah, it's yeah, important yeah. to say that American slavery, doubtless from anyone's perspective, was a British institution. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, we, we, got, we got hooked on that. And I, I think it's funny that leftists can take any, any heinous criminal who's performed any series of heinous crimes and say, well, let's look at the historical context. Let's see, this guy was raised in a really violent home. But they can't do that, even a little, for American slavery and say, well, I mean, what were the muscle economies? The, in the original 13 colonies, the muscle economy was Virginia, which was based on all this slave labor. Is it immoral? You bet. Is it a grave moral evil? You bet to be getting that much free labor. But the idea of America at the outset was let's get rid of this evil, let's slowly tip the scales. But if they did away with slavery in the middle of the war against England, then it would have been a done deal. They would have been done. If they would have done it in the next 20 years, it would have been done. And, I mean, Here's a few things that people don't know, I don't think. One is that 10% of the population is estimated in the Upper South at the time of the war were free blacks. And a place like New Orleans had a relatively big population of free blacks. So it was already happening. It was happening slowly, but it was happening. And it's, I think, also relevant that the Confederate Constitution prohibits the uh, restarting of the slave trade. Right, right. So, I, I mean, these are all sorts of, anyways, the limitations upon, I mean, people were guilty about it. The, peop the, the, the states that were allegedly fighting for slavery were certainly guilty feeling guilty about that aspect of it. Right. And, um, but they, were, they thought there were overwhelmingly more important issues involved, which we can even see from two quickly other things. One is some of the border states, like Maryland, that were you know, under martial law, were slave states. I mean, not all the slave states went with the South, by force or by choice. Um, and uh, you know, but even when Lincoln did the Emancipation Proclamation, which has no real <laughs> I would argue legal value, but as you, as you may know, I mean, it did not liberate slaves in areas occupied by the Union Army. 
So in these border states, which Lincoln wanted to keep on side, it had no effect there. The Emancipation Proclamation was only supposed to, the way it's written is it places in rebellion against the Union. Those slaves are to be free. So it's really kind of a it writ without any power. Right. But if you were a Southerner and you were off fighting and your sons are off fighting and your wife is back home at the plantation, you see this as the ultimate dirty trick. You see it as an invitation for a slave rebellion <laughs> against your wife and kids. And I think it speaks to the credit of people in the South, black and white. That didn't happen. I think that is a remarkable thing, too, that people ignore. Assumed. That the, the, you know, it, it was a great fear throughout Southern history of something that happened like in Haiti, of the slave rebellion, or a Nat Turner type thing writ large. Right. It didn't happen. And so, um, I mean, I th again, I think people back then were much more, well, they, I mean, there are obvious exceptions, and you had the radical Republicans and whatnot, but this idea of a human society, not so riven by ideology, but tied together by human sentiment mm -hmm. is something that we are rapidly losing and is the, well, that and the irrationality are the t two most dangerous viruses. This is, why, uh, this is why Jesus talks about neighbors so much, and this is why the central Catholic organizing principle for the polis, for politics, for culture, is subsidiarity. Like, there, there's, a, a, I'll give you the last word here, Harry, because we're, we're about out of time, but, but, but comment on this as a kind of parting shot, if you would. I am morally responsible for, to some extent, to some attenuated extent, for what my republic does, a res publica, right? Montesquieu said it's, there are three cardinal sins, you know, cardinal rules. It's got to be small, it's got to be morally unified, and therefore it's got to be uh, singular, you know, not, not plural. It's got to be uh, uh, non-pluralistic. Because of this idea of theory, uh, uh, sorry, virtual representation, we're like, we're all kind of responsible for each other. So it's got to be geographically small. If you want to keep the club ideologically pure, you got to keep it a small club. And therefore, we can all be somewhat accountable for one another. If my republic is this neighborhood, it's really easy to do. And you can see, you know, Little Malta, the Venetian Republic. Uh, there are other examples of republics. The Swiss cantons that lasted a thousand years. The, fra the framers of this country were very aware of those. And they said, look, this is why the, the anti-federalists anyway said, let's, let's keep this proposition small, the proposition of America, and let's, let's have multiple states that are the real countries. Our states will be really the people whom we share a res publica with. And therefore, you know, the people of the northern colonies, they can do what they want to do. We in the south, we can do what we want to do. If we take a risk, morally speaking, with propagating slavery 20 more years and then doing away with it, and the people of the North don't like it, well, they're not morally accountable for us anyway, right? So the, the virtual theory of representation is that which corresponds really with the gospel. We're accountable for us and not someone across the globe who's hungry, someone in our day-to-day -day life. The guy, the, you know, if a neighbor's house burns down and you don't help him, heaven help you, you know? It's our neighbors. It's subsidiarity that, that Pope... Pius XI taught in 1931's Quadrigesa Milano. This is the main principle. We're responsible for helping those we see. Another Pius, Pius IX, was a great fan, therefore, of the Confederacy, not because he liked slavery. He, he, he's the only world leader who called Jefferson Davis honorable, esteemed president. Again, not because of slavery, but because he identified with Jefferson Davis. Pius IX was... Uh, having the papal states reduced to the size of a park uh, by the unification of Italy. And he associated that with big liberal Lincoln, and he I identified with Jefferson Davis. And Catholics don't talk about this enough anymore. So by way of parting shot, would you just help to, to tell the parish orphans and retrogrades out there why small is beautiful, why smaller is better, why... Secession is, again, you already said it once, a not a prelude to war, but an alternative to war, and why we should really associate ourselves with the people of our state more than the people of the continent-sized United States of America, and, and how this can, can be instructive going forward. So I'll, I'll give you the last word. All right, well, um, yeah, I, 
as I said before, secession is an alternative to war. It's also a way to have control over your own life. I mean, the more that we are can be participants in the civ civil civic life of our town, our city, our city, that's doable. But like, if you, if you live in California, like our relatives, you're like shut out. You have no voice in the state government. You have no voice in in the national government, if, as far as California elects, you know, senators or or uh, elects a president. And you know, in many of those counties, you, just, you have you have no voice. Period. Yeah. So it's important I think, for people to be in a place. Where, where they can have a voice. They can feel like they're actually participating with their neighbors in self-government. Um, and I, I wish that <laughs> we had more of these counties that shared, I, getting back to the beginning of this, all of the, at the beginning, a, a common culture. I mean, I, I'm, my heart mourns for that. <laughs> when the statues come down, when I have PC rubbed in my face, as we are talking about during the commercials during football games, I, I find this tragic for my children and also for me. I just hate it so much. Why can't, I would love to get back to that commonality of culture, which can only come through a, a uh, I think, again, a great revival. But I will say, as my parting shot, actually, a plug for one of my own books. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's the best way to party. <laughs> which, and lately, I've been giving off this history angle, or at least direct history, writing these novels, these comic novels about George Armstrong Custer, but partly they come back to this because they're all set after the Civil War, Custer was a general of the Civil War. And the, the, the novels are about how Custer actually secretly survived the Battle of the Bighorn, becomes this knight errant do-gooder, marshal in the West. But part of the theme and the atmosphere of, the, of these books is the post-war world. And one of his sidekicks is a former Confederate officer. And, they, and even though the books are meant to be funny and exciting adventure stories, um, there is a definite <laughs> political intent running as a sort of baseline through it. And this is part of it, is trying to recapture a common understanding of American history and culture, hmm. um, which I hope that readers can both get a chuckle out of them, can enjoy them as adventure stories, but also sent, you know, get this wistful, at least, if not instructive sense of, yeah, that's right. We were once all one people, and these are the values that could bring us back together again. Is, is, does Regner put that out? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they actually did. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So uh, what, what's the series called? Uh, the first book was called Armstrong. The second book is called Armstrong Rides Again, and I am at work now in the third book, which is about Armstrong and the Mexican mystery. <laughs> Harry Crocker, that sounds mysterious, my friend. <laughs> and get those uh, good books, at least the first two, now on Regnery, Regnery Books, largest publisher of conservative books in the world, really. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's... And, and uh, you know... But that's I, that large is bad in this case. Yeah, 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 large is good. No, no, <laughs> small is beautiful except with book publishers. That's, that's, I'm glad you made that stipulation. Folks, final plug, then we're out of here. You know that both Harry and I are a couple of native Californians because we've told you now throughout the, the course of this cast. And both of us got to Mississippi and both of us are loving it, right? Yeah, I, so. I am endorsed by Real Estate for Life. Go to realestateforlife.org if you want to see what they can do for you. And I tell a, a tale that resonates with people more than it does even on larger channels when I plug Real Estate for Life because I say, look, get out of your blue states, get to a red state, balkanization, the grouping principle of conservatives to make a really red section of the country, more red than it is now, is the first step to a lot of the things we're talking about here today. You need to be able to trust your neighbor across the neighborhood, the one that you'd never hang out with. You might not even know his name. You need to be able to trust the people that are growing up near you and your kids. Their kids, your kids can play together even if they don't. You can trust them. You can borrow a cup of sugar or flour even if you don't know their names. You can't do that in the blue states. There's no commonality of purpose. So get from the bluest of the blue to the reddest of the red. You're looking at two southern gentlemen of leisure now <laughs> who, who did this, right? And, and we're walking proof. There is life. I'm proof there's life after cancellation. Uh, Harry's proof that you can just be an amazing southern novelist, even if you lived most of your life in places like California or England. He's been all around. And I would just admonish you to take a hard look at the real possibility of grouping yourself rather than waiting to be moved move yourself 
before they shut down state borders, which they're talking about doing, trapping people out and in, get to a red state, and there's there's no better place than the American South, you know, from, from Texas to Florida. Anyway, go to realestateforlife.org. Thanks a million. Harry, thanks for being with me today. This has been a lot of fun. We're going to have to wait and see on the prospect of the next wars. Uh, we don't know the day or the time, and the revolution will not be televised, and we have nothing to do with it, if there even <laughs> is one. So, The good people at YouTube should know that, as Michael Scott said. All right, God bless you all. Stay strong. Stay tough. Uh, stay tuned in.